Paul McCartney worked together with John Lennon, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr to change the music industry forever. Nobody has come close to the Beatles, not even after their breakup in April 1970. Up until now, the real reason for the band's separation remained a mystery. Nobody really knew who or what broke up the Beatles. But now, after all this time, Paul McCartney has finally spoken up. In a recent interview, he revealed some very unexpected things that left many fans in shock. In this video, we'll dive into what happened behind the scenes of this popular band. But before we get to that, let's quickly look back at Paul's amazing trip and his time with the famous band. Paul McCartney was born in the Walton neighborhood of Liverpool on June 18, 1942. He became famous as a member of the Beatles. McCartney was a huge part of creating the band's sound. He was known for being a great singer, songwriter, and musician. He wrote some of the most popular songs in music history with John Lennon. McCartney did not have a fancy youth. He grew up in a poor family. Jim, his dad, used to work in sales but became a lathe maker during the war. Mary, his mom, was a dedicated nurse and midwife. Even though they had problems, McCartney's parents taught him to be very strong. Paul went to Stockton Wood Road Primary School for his early education. After passing the 11-plus test, he went to the Liverpool Institute. On the bus ride to school, this is where he met George Harrison and became best friends with him. Paul McCartney was a great musician, and his unique melodic bass playing and wide singing range showed it. His relationship with John Lennon formed the core of the Beatles' sound and set the standard for how great a song should be. Sad to say, Paul's mother, Mary, died on October 31, 1956, after having problems after surgery for breast cancer. He was greatly affected by this loss, and it brought him close to Lennon, who had also lost his mother not long before. Because of his dad, Jim McCartney, Paul has always been interested in music. Jim was a singer and led Jim Mack's jazz band in the 1920s. They played music all the time in their house. He pushed Paul and his younger brother to use their musical skills, and he even suggested that Paul take piano classes, although Paul liked learning by ear more than going to school. How did Paul McCartney get to be in the Beatles? We'll get to that soon enough. When Paul was 14, his dad gave him a nickel-plated trumpet for his birthday. However, rock and roll called, and Paul was moved by greats like Little Richard to trade in his trumpet for a famous Zenith acoustic guitar. After seeing a poster of Slim Whitman, a left-handed musician, Paul flipped the strings to fit his own left-handed style. At first, he had trouble playing the right-handed guitar. In fact, he wrote his first songs on Zenith. That's when his real journey as a guitarist and songwriter started. Soon after, he sang Long Tall Sally by Little Richard at a talent show. This was the beginning of his rise to fame as a musician. On July 6, 1957, Paul McCartney met John Lennon at a church party in Woolton. John's band, The Quarrymen, was playing. John was only 15 years old at the time. They played a cool mix of rock and roll, skiffle, jazz, blues, and folk music. Lennon and the band were pleased by McCartney's musical skills, and they quickly asked him to join as a rhythm guitarist. They went on to work together in one of the most famous records ever. By 1958, George Harrison had joined as lead guitarist. In 1960, Stuart Sutcliffe, a friend of Lennon's from art school, added his bass skills to the group. The group went through a few name changes before settling on The Beatles in August 1960, just before they hired Dave Page as their drummer. Soon after, they went to Hamburg, Germany, for a stint that would shape their sound and help them grow as a band. Rise to Fame with The Beatles A year after they decided on the name The Beatles, Stuart Sutcliffe quit the band in 1961, and McCartney took over as bass player. As the band began to play around with their songs, he stepped up to the challenge. They made their first professional recording as a backing band for English singer Tony Sheridan in their early years in Hamburg. They used the name The Beat Brothers on the song My Bonnie. Brain Epstein heard this song and quickly hired them as their manager in January 1962, 
taking their career to new heights. In late 1962, Ringo Starr took over for Pete Best, and the band's first hit song, Love Me Do, came out in October. This was the start of Beatlemania, first in the UK and then in the US the next year. As the saying goes, the rest is history. In the height of Beatlemania, Paul McCartney's charm and musical skill won him the nickname The Cute Beatle. His work with John Lennon on songs became very popular, and they wrote early Beatles hits like I Saw Her Standing There, She Loves You, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and Can't Buy Me Love. In August 1965, McCartney showed how versatile he was with the beautiful song Yesterday, which had a string quartet. This song marked a move toward classical music and is now one of the most performed songs ever. McCartney became more important to the Beatles after their album Rubber Soul came out. He helped with writing songs, playing instruments, arranging music, producing, and even being the secret musical director. The reflective songs on the record, like In My Life, showed how McCartney and Lennon were growing as songwriters, moving away from the simpler pop music they had been making before. When the Beatles put out Revolver in 1966, it was the next step in their creative process. Eleanor Rigby by McCartney was a great song because it pushed the limits with its experimental sound and deep words. Revolver marked a turning point and gave hints of the even more groundbreaking music that was to come. The Beatles' last paid show was in the U.S. in 1966. After that, McCartney started his first job by himself. He and George Martin worked together on the music for the U.K. movie The Family Way. Although the music wasn't a big hit, McCartney received praise for it and was even given an Ivor Novello Award for Best Instrumental Theme. It was an early sign that he could do well without the Beatles. After the Beatles quit touring, Paul McCartney saw that they needed a new direction. He took the lead on a big new project that would go down in history as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This groundbreaking record, which came out in June 1967, is often called the first concept album in rock history. The Beatles took a more creative approach to the recording process, which began in November 1966. A Day in the Life, a standout track, had a huge 40-piece orchestra that McCartney and producer George Martin both led. It was a great example of the album's big ideas. It was during this creative surge that the famous song Strawberry Fields Forever came out in February 1967. Unfortunately, their manager, Brian Epstein, died in August 1967. McCartney stepped up to take on a bigger leadership role in the band, both musically and in terms of business. After Epstein left, McCartney took over many of the band's choices and became the de facto leader, a job that John Lennon had previously held. He was a big part of making the TV movie Magical Mystery Tour, which he also directed. The movie got mixed reviews, but the soundtrack was a big hit, showing that they could still make music magic. The Beatles kept making art with the cartoon movie Yellow Submarine, which was based on McCartney's earlier song. When it came out in July 1968, the movie was praised for its groundbreaking animation and songs by the Beatles. But behind the scenes, things were getting worse in the band. By the time they worked on The White Album in late 1968, things were getting worse. They didn't stop until they started recording Let It Be in 1969. McCartney was worried that the band wasn't going in the right direction, especially without Epstein's direction. Even though they were having problems within the band, the Beatles were able to work together on one last record, Abbey Road. McCartney and producer George Martin pushed for a more cohesive and symphonic approach, which showed off the band's talent one last time even though members had different ideas about how the band should sound, which made it seem like the breakup was almost certain. In October 1969, a strange and funny rumor started going around that Paul McCartney had died in a car accident years before and been quietly replaced by someone who looked like him. The rumor that there were clues in the Beatles records was quickly put to rest when McCartney was seen on the cover of Life magazine in November 1969 with his family smiling and looking very much alive. Even though that story was put to rest, 
Things were still not going well with the Beatles, and they broke up just a year later. Who broke up with them? After many years, McCartney finally told the truth. But let's look at what happened next first. Paul McCartney and Wings McCartney went through a very bad period of sadness after the Beatles broke up. During that hard time, his wife Linda was there for him and helped him feel better. She kept telling him to work on writing songs, so McCartney wrote the touching tune, Maybe I'm Amazed, to thank her continuously. The song talked about how she kept him mentally stable when things were going badly. The record McCartney, which came out in 1970, was McCartney's first work as a solo artist. It went straight to the top of the U.S. charts and set the tone for the rest of his career after leaving the Beatles. After a year, he worked with Linda and drummer Denny Sywell to make Ram, which was another hit record that went to number one in the U.K. and did well in the U.S. as well. In September 1971, Paul, Linda, and Sywell put together Wings as a real band. Wings went on their first live tour in 1972 after adding guitarist Henry McCullough to the group. The band quickly picked up speed and confidence, and they're now ready for their next tour of Europe. Paul McCartney and his band went on the Wings Over Europe tour in 1972. They played 25 shows over seven weeks and mostly played songs from McCartney's solo work and Wings' early work. McCartney purposely chose smaller venues with crowds of less than 3,000 people instead of huge ones. This kept things cozy and let the band create their own sound in a more personal setting. My Love, from Wings' album Red Rose Speedway, became their first number one song in the U.S. in March 1973. This was a big deal. In the same year, they launched Live and Let Die, the famous theme song for James Bond. It was written with George Martin, who had worked with McCartney as a member of the Beatles. The song was a huge hit, and the orchestral arrangement that went with it got a Grammy. Henry McCulloch and Dennis Sywell quit the band in 1973, but McCartney, Linda, and Denny Lane kept going and made the album Band on the Run. This record was a huge hit, going to the top of the charts in both the US and the UK. Wings became a major rock band after this album, and the title track won a Grammy Award for Best Pop Vocal Performance. Even though they changed some players, Wings kept up the good work. After Band on the Run, they had two more records that went straight to the top of the charts, Venus and Mars, 1975, and Wings at the Speed of Sound, 1976. Wings were ready for their biggest project yet by 1975 the Wings Over the World Tour. They went on this huge tour for 14 months, going to the UK, Europe, Australia, and the US. The tour was such a hit that a live record called Wings Over America was made to capture the energy and excitement of their shows all over the world. Wings hit a whole new level with the single Mull of Kintyre in 1977. McCartney and Denny Lane wrote the song together. In the UK, the song was a huge hit that broke sales records and cemented Wings' reputation. Wings' song, Mull of Kintyre, was the best-selling single in the UK until 1984. After that, the band continued to have big hits with albums like London Town, 1978, and Back to the Egg, 1979, which both had number one songs. By 1980, McCartney was back to working on his own. He released McCartney 2, which had the hit song Coming Up, which was the last number one hit for Wings. But problems within the band led McCartney to break up Wings in 1981, which was the end of an era. McCartney and Wonder worked together on the hit song Ebony and Ivory in 1982. George Martin recorded the song. This song became McCartney's 28th number one hit on the Billboard Hot 100, which is a record. He worked with Michael Jackson on the song The Girl Is Mine from Jackson's famous album Thriller that same year. They continued to work together on the hit song Say, Say, Say in 1983. In 1984, McCartney tried his hand at making a movie with Give My Regards to Broad Street, a musical in which he also wrote and produced. Even though critics didn't like the movie, the soundtrack did well. It went to number one in the UK and had the hit song No More Lonely Nights in the US. 
McCartney wrote the theme song for the movie Spies Like Us in 1985 and put on a great show at Live Aid. The next year, he worked on the record Press to Play with Eric Stewart. In 1988, he released Back in the USSR, which was his next original work. At first, it was only sold in the Soviet Union. McCartney, Jerry Marsden, and Holly Johnson all put out a version of Ferry Cross the Mersey in 1989 to raise money for the Hillsboro Disaster Appeal. He also produced the album Flowers in the Dirt that same year, which included songs with Elvis Costello and others, including David Gilmour and Nicky Hopkins. McCartney started his first tour in over 10 years, the Paul McCartney World Tour, with a bang. At the very end of the tour, he played a famous show at the Americana Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to an amazing 184,000 fans, which broke all kinds of records. To honor the tour, he put out a triple album called Tripping the Live Fantastic, which had recordings of some of his best acts. McCartney tried writing music for an orchestra for the first time in 1991 when he worked with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Society on the Liverpool Oratorio, which he wrote with Carl Davis. Though it got mixed reviews, the Oratorio was the most popular classical piece in the UK. Earlier that year, he performed on MTV Unplugged and put out a live record called Unplugged, which showed a less complicated side of his music. McCartney also tried out computer music in the 1990s. It was he and Youth from Killing Joke, who put out two albums as The Firemen. Their first album, Strawberry's Ocean Ships Forest, came out in 1993. After switching back to rock, McCartney released the record Off the Ground in 1993. He then went on the New World Tour, which led to the release of another live album called Paul Is Leave. Then, from 1994 to 1998, he worked on the Beatles Anthology Project, which was a big look back at the band's career. His rock record, Flaming Pie, which came out in 1997 and got good reviews, had Ringo Starr play drums on the song Beautiful Night. In the same year, he returned to classical music with Standing Stone, which was the number one classical song in both the UK and the US. The second Fireman record, Rushes, came out in 1998, and McCartney continued his wide range of musical styles with the release of Run, Devil, Run in 1999. He also played at the Royal Albert Hall for the Concert for Linda, which was an honor to his late wife. McCartney tried electronic music again in 2000 with Liverpool Sound Collage, which he made with Super Furry Animals and Youth. He also provided the song Nova to the album A Garland for Linda, which was a tribute to his late wife. After the September 11th attacks, McCartney was very important in putting together the concert for New York City. In November 2001, the studio record Driving Rain came out. The album Driving Rain had the song Freedom, which was a touching reaction to the terrible events of September 11th. In 2002, McCartney went on the road with his Driving World Tour. He had a new band with guitarists Rusty Anderson and Brian Ray, keyboardist Paul Wicks Wickens, and drummer Abe Laborio Jr., backing him up. The show was a huge hit, bringing in an amazing $126.2 million. During the same year, McCartney remembered George Harrison by singing at the Concert for George on the first anniversary of Harrison's death. McCartney also made a big splash at the pregame show for Super Bowl 36 in 2002 and at the halftime show for Super Bowl 39 in 2005. He played at Live 8 in London's Hyde Park in 2005, and in September of that year, his rock album Chaos and Creation in the Backyard came out. After this came the classical piece Exe Cormium in 2006 and the rock record Memory Almost Full the next year. Along with that, his third fireman record, Electric Arguments, came out in 2008. After a break, McCartney went on tour again the next year and played more than 80 shows to celebrate EMI's reissue of the Beatles' catalog, which included digital remastering and the release of the video game The Beatles' Rock Band. 
He wowed fans with three sold-out shows at New York's City Field, which led to the release of the double live record, Good Evening, New York City. In 2010, McCartney helped open the Consul Energy Center in Pittsburgh. The next year, he played two sold-out shows at the brand new Yankee Stadium. Also, he signed with Decca Records and put out his first dance score, Ocean's Kingdom, along with Kisses on the Bottom. Musicians Against AIDS named him Person of the Year in 2011, and he played at the 54th Grammy Awards. In 2012, McCartney continued to amaze fans by performing for over 100,000 people in Mexico City, ending Queen Elizabeth's Diamond Jubilee concert and leading the opening performance for the London 2012 Summer Olympics. He also kept up his charitable work by performing at the concert for Sandy Relief and putting out the record New in 2013. Early in 2014, McCartney was a part of The Night That Changed America, a Grammy salute to the Beatles. He also played at San Francisco's Candlestick Park. Paul McCartney has kept the music scene going strong by working with some great artists. He worked with Kanye West on Only One, and with West and Rihanna on the hit song Four Five Seconds, which they performed at the Grammys. McCartney slayed on stage with Paul Simon on Saturday Night Live's 40th anniversary special in 2015, and got down with the Hollywood vampires on a cover of his own song, Come and Get It. McCartney's greatest hits album, Pure McCartney, came out in 2016, and his 2018 record, Egypt Station, made waves by topping the Billboard 200. He then put out McCartney 3 in December 2020 which was his first number one solo album in the UK since 1989. It was all taped during the COVID-19 lockdowns. The next album he released was McCartney 3 Imagined in 2021. His book, The Lyrics 1956 to the Present, came out in November 2021 and got great reviews. McCartney went on the Got Back Tour in the US in 2022. One of the most important events of the tour was his performance at Glastonbury where he became the oldest single headliner. He won a Primetime Emmy Award for The Beatles' Get Back and published a book called 1964 Eyes of the Storm in 2023. It is full of photos he took during the height of Beatlemania. But McCartney's story is still being told. One man was a friend, a lover, a husband, and a father. He was also the force behind all the Beatles mania. Let's get to know the man behind the music before we hear what he had to say about the breakup of the Beatles. Life after the Beatles. Besides his singing, McCartney has been busy with a number of other projects. There was a memorable guest performance on The Simpsons in 1995, and he produced and hosted The Real Buddy Holly Story in 1985. He also made a short film about the Grateful Dead, and was thought to be the richest musician in the UK in 2015, with a fortune of 730 million. In his personal life, McCartney's first love was Dorothy Dot Roan, whom he met at the Casbah Club in Liverpool in 1959. McCartney was very controlling in their relationship. He chose her clothes and makeup and even suggested she change her hairstyle to look like Brigitte Bardot. McCartney's personal life has been just as interesting as his music business. After ending his relationship with Dorothy Dot Roan because of a miscarriage and a sense of duty, McCartney met Jane Asher and fell in love with her. In April 1963, they met at a Beatles show and couldn't be separated after that. McCartney moved in with the Asher family in Marylebone, and they dated for more than two years before moving to his house in St. John's Wood in 1966. McCartney wrote many well-known songs during this time, such as Yesterday, And I Love Her, You Won't See Me, and I'm Looking Through You. Even though they wanted to get married, their romance ended in 1968 when Asher found out that McCartney was seeing an American screenwriter named Francie Schwartz. Schwartz went to London to try to sell a script to the Beatles. He dated McCartney for a short time before the relationship ended. The Beatles were going through big changes in their personal and work lives. McCartney was very involved in the rough recording of the White Album. Not long after that, McCartney started going out with American photographer Linda Eastman, 
whom he had met at a Georgie Fame show in London in 1967. Linda was interested in John Lennon at first, but when she met Paul, she became interested in him instead. McCartney and Eastman got married in March 1969, even though they almost called off the wedding the night before because of a fight. When the Beatles broke up in 1970, McCartney and Linda got together and made the band wings. Even though they had problems and were criticized, they worked together on music until Linda died of breast cancer in 1998. Paul said that they had a fun and satisfying marriage. After she died, he went to therapy to deal with his guilt and feelings of not being good enough. Following Linda McCartney's death, Paul McCartney's personal life was a mix of well-known relationships and problems. In 2002, he married Heather Mills, who used to be a model and now works to stop landmines. In 2003, they had a girl named Beatrice Millie. Even with this happy addition, the media paid a lot of attention to their marriage and often painted Mills in a bad light. Their relationship was strained by lifestyle, value, and personal problems, and in 2008, they got a split that was very heated. McCartney married Nancy Chevelle, who was the vice president of a shipping company in 2011. They began dating in 2007 while McCartney was still married to Mills. They had known each other for about 20 years because they both lived in the Hamptons. Their marriage has become more private and safe over the years. In October 2023, they will celebrate their 12th wedding anniversary. They like taking vacations together, like the trip they just got back from to St. Bart's in March 2024. On vacations, they do things like fitness routines and relaxing on the beach. Besides his ties with other people, McCartney's life has also been marked by his drug use. He first used drugs in the 1960s with Preludin in Hamburg to keep himself energetic during shows. Later, cannabis became an important part of his life after Bob Dylan brought it to him in 1964. He even used cannabis in his music, most famously in the song, Got to Get You Into My Life. McCartney gave up cannabis in 2015 to be a good example for his grandkids, even though he had tried LSD, cocaine, and other drugs. Even though McCartney's life has been full of problems and issues, it has also had peaceful times. In 1975, he and Linda went to a farm and watched lambs grazing with their moms. It was a peaceful experience that was a contrast to the chaos in his personal and public life. When they went to a farm and saw lambs with their mothers, they were moved to tears and understood how eating meat hurts animals. This made them want to fight for animal rights and fair care. It was important to them that their food brand, Linda McCartney Foods, didn't have any GMOs. McCartney also supported groups like PETA and the Humane Society. He took part in efforts to stop hunting seals and landmines, among other things. That wasn't the end of his activism. He's been involved in a huge number of global problems, from protecting the environment to fighting poverty and fracking. He's also done a lot of charity work through benefit shows, charity records, and donating his own money. McCartney supports a lot of things, from Aung San Suu Kyi to working for green practices and NHS charities. He even paid for the Tree Register yearbook in 2024. Who did the Beatles really break up with? Well, McCartney was the one who got blamed when the Fab Four broke up in 1970. McCartney cleared the air about the split of the Beatles not long ago. He said that John Lennon was the one who started it all. When McCartney talked to John Wilson of BBC Radio 4, he said that Lennon's announcement that he was leaving the band was like a messy breakup. All of this was up to McCartney and the others to handle. McCartney finally ended the Beatles' business partnership when he sued his bandmates, but he wasn't the one who first brought them together. McCartney said that Lennon's choice was affected by the fact that he and Yoko Ono were becoming more involved in politics and social issues. They believed in bagism, a movement that urges people to see past what they see on the surface. They also held famous bed-ins for peace in Amsterdam and Montreal to protest the Vietnam War. McCartney thought the breakup was one of the worst times of his life and often wished that the band had kept going without Lennon's leaving. Even with all the trouble, the Beatles are still a very important part of music history. Their innovative approach to making songs, working in the studio, and having an effect on culture 
changed the music world for good. The Beatles didn't just break records, they broke the mold. They started out playing in small places in Liverpool and quickly became famous all over the world. They mixed different kinds of music, were very creative, and completely changed the game. It's not just their number one hits that matter. When they made Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, they created the concept record, tried out new sounds and technologies, and used their fame to push for social change. With their different styles and ideas, the Beatles created a sound that perfectly captured the spirit of the 1960s and still speaks to people today. After they broke up, they went their different ways, but their work together is still unmatched and inspires artists and musicians all over the world. There are Beatles-like sounds in all kinds of music, from pop to rock to experimental. The Beatles are remembered not only as a band, but also as pioneers who changed modern music and society. Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are still performing and celebrating their legacy.